Yes, yeah. absolutely. Both kind of obsessed with ice baths and cold, cold plunges. Yeah. And I've been going deep into that literature around cold and what's really known about cold thermogenesis and not known. And it seems like the, these acute adrenaline, acute pain pathways, they do exactly what exercise does, which is in the moment, if you were to measure somebody's inflammation, et cetera, you'd say this person is dying. They're in a terrible state. They might as well be getting, you know, open heart surgery with no anesthesia, the way some people react to the ice bath. It's kind of silly the, to us. But for people that don't like the cold, they're like, you got to be kidding me. I'd never go near it. They try and disparage it. They try and poke every hole in the data. They're just scared, right? Yeah. They're just scared. We know this. But they are actually the people that benefit the most because that really acute adrenaline spike, that pain that you feel creates a l higher pain threshold later, higher threshold for work output, all the things that most people seek. And so to me, it's always interesting that it, you have to look what's happening during and you have to look at what's happening afterward. And I, for some reason, as humans, we like these creature comforts of massages, which are great. Um, you know, the sauna, which is great. Although if you crank it up really hot, it's work. I just had Susanna Soberg out to, uh, for a podcast. Um, and she taught me some really interesting things. First of all, this has really helped. I did this. We should explain that she's the woman who created the Soberg principle. Yeah. And yeah. Susanna Soberg uh, did her PhD um, in Denmark is I, I think one of the best scientists in terms of deliberate cold exposure and its benefits, because she, she actually did something that's remarkable. It, not just in that field, but overall, which is that she employed real world type ex experiences and exercise of deliberate cold and sauna and turned it into a very rigorous study of brown fat thermogenesis, which is this, this sort of, think of it as sort of your, like the oil in the candle of your body increases mitochondrial function and thermogenesis heats you up, metabolism, uh, subjective well being, sleep, et cetera. She did all of that and published this in Cell Reports Medicine. And I realize it's just one study, but to do the studies on humans is hard. To do it with multiple variables is even harder. And to do it in a real world context is even harder. So what she showed was that if people get 11 minutes of deliberate cold exposure per week total, and this is divided up into sessions of one to three minutes or four minutes even. So it's not 11 minutes all at once. They fundamentally change the amount of brown fat that they have which means they fundamentally change the number of mitochondria in the brown fat, which means they fundamentally change their thermogenic properties of their body, increase their metabolism. Now, the, the people who don't like cold say, well, the increase in metabolism wasn't enough to offset more than a few bites of a bagel or something. But that's not the point, really. What she also showed was that this increase in thermogenesis allowed people to be more comfortable in cold environments, even when they're not in the cold. And then people say, well, who cares, right? I'll throw on a, a jacket. Ah, but what she was able to show is that the ability to be comfortable in the cold correlates with a bunch of other important immune functions and metabolic functions and insulin sensitivity, which is a good thing. And the inability to do that is likely to not be healthy for us. She also showed that 57 minutes per week is the threshold for sauna. So if people get 57 minutes per week of uncomfortably warm but safe sauna exposure, they can get very similar effects. And it and then that gave rise to this question. I always said, do you end with cold or do you end with heat? And she said, end with cold because then your body's forced to warm itself back up. Mm. And that's what's now called the Soberg principle, which is when you end with cold, your body has to use its natural machinery to heat back up. In talking to her recently, I learned some really interesting things that I've been incorporating. First of all, I've always avoided putting my head under until the very end in the cold. Turns out that if you put your face in the water right as you go in, you activate the mammalian dive reflex. And this reflex increases the so-called parasympathetic activity of the autonomic nervous system, which is just nerd speak for, it lowers your heart rate, it makes you calmer, and it makes you better able to tolerate stress. So try this next time, Go. you could even just put your face in before- I go right under. You go right under. Yeah. So that's the I right way to do it. I plug my nose, I go right under. So I didn't know this. A lot of people that do deliberate cold get headaches, they don't feel good. And a lot of times it's because they slowly immerse themselves up to the neck. And then right at that interface of cold and hot, it, it creates change vasoconstriction right below, a little bit vasodilation above. They get headaches. They don't feel good. The heart rate is way too high. Putting your face under Isn't really Isn't that anxiety, helps. though? I, I just feel like that's all psychological. I really do. Because there's, there's a moment when you get in the cold where 
there's a part of your brain that goes, let's get out of here. You can get out of this if you will just get out right now. And you got to go shut the fuck up. But if you don't say shut the fuck up, then that thing runs rampant through your brain. And that kicks your heart rate up and that kicks your anxiety up. I really think it's psychological. Well, it's psychological and it's physiological. So here's right, what, physiological yeah. because of psychological. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. So here's what we know for sure. For the first 20 to 30 seconds of cold shock when you get in, mm -hmm. which is how it's described, that prefrontal cortex that normally has the job of handling context and says shh to the reflexes of the brain and the impulses of the brain is not active for 20 to 30 seconds. So your reflex to get the hell out of there mm. is very there's a clear and logical reason for that after that 20 or 30 seconds the forebrain starts coming online again that's your opportunity to start negotiating with yourself of oh this is actually good for me this this is i can handle this i got through that so i can get through the next one what i've been doing recently is trying to not go for time but going for the only way i can describe this would be walls like sometimes just getting in the thing there is a wall for me so I, okay i got over one wall just getting in the damn thing then like, oh God, here it comes. Four brains shutting down. I'm like panicking. I'm going to get through this. And then I'm watching for when I have the impulse to get out. And what I start to notice is that the, the gaps between those walls start getting longer and longer. The more you do it. The more you, you do it. You have one at your house? I do. Yeah. And then pretty soon what's happened How is... How cold is it? Uh, it's hard. I, I suppose it's probably in the low 50s. What? Low 50s or Why high, is it high so 40s. warm? I don't know, low 50s, high 40s. Why do you do that? I stay in there longer. I don't know. Well, we have two. I, I confess we have the Morozco one, which yeah. is that one's really cold. And that one is... You that, avoid that one. Sometimes. Look I at like you. to go in the sauna first. I don't like what I'm hearing. <laughs> and, uh, well, here's the thing. I've been doing longer exposure in the warmer one. That's so much easier, though. It is. We had one here that was kind of broken, and yeah. it was at 54 degrees. Okay, that's too warm. I climbed in, I'm like, this is a fucking joke. What, 50's okay, yeah. though? All right. I, I, listen, what... 34. 34 That's is where what you're I like. at. Yeah, you and Kem Haynes. 34. Um, listen, I like it where the ice breaks I, I just off got the bottom of the thing and nice. floats to the top. Yeah, yeah, I need to go colder. I, I will get in the ice one. What is this will need to go? Why don't you just do it? Well, I, there are mornings I'll just jump in the cold one for 30 seconds. I do it every fucking day. Yeah. I don't have any negotiation. Yeah. There's no negotiation. No, no, I'm not saying I don't go in every day. I'm saying I don't always go into that one first. I go first thing in the morning. Okay. Well, you're a, you're a better man. No, it's we not already a better man. It's just do it. <laughs> It's just if you have like all these room, this negotiation room and all this leeway, then you won't do it. If you just, br I brush my teeth every day. Do you? Twice a day. Yeah. Well, get in the fucking cold. Just do it. All right. I'll start going. Just ice. do it. It's three minutes. You know, so, in the beginning when I first got it, I would like procrastinate. I'd get a cup of coffee. And then I looked down at my phone. And it was 12 minutes later. I was like, I already be done. Okay. I would have been done eight minutes ago. Well, I'm going to get thermometers, a second thermometer for the sauna, verify. <laughs> you know, I'm going to verify the data, second independent measurement, and the, and the cold. I may have to imagine that the Morozco one, because it has pieces of ice floating in it, has got to be colder than 50. Yeah, um, I bet it is. You can tell if you know what the Morozco has two lids. You have the lid where you climb in, and there's another lid where the equipment is. If you lift up that equipment lid, you'll see a thermometer. Okay. You'll see a digital thermometer that's a setting. It's like what it's set at and what it's actually at. Okay. And well, I, I guarantee you're probably in the 30s. Okay. Um, so I've been doing shorter exposures there and then longer exposures in the 51. What's the longer in the 51? Well, I'm in there a while. Like how long? So that one, when I go in there, I'm staying, you know, 10, 20 minutes. And here's really? the reason. The, the study that was published in the European Journal of Physiology that showed these huge increases in dopamine, that was the first of these sorts of studies. I don't know if I've mentioned this, but when you go in the cold for a very brief period of time, one to three minutes, mm -hmm. and it's shockingly cold, you yeah. have to catch your breath, stabilize your mind, that evokes a dopamine, epinephrine, and norepinephrine release. These three things together are called the catecholamines. Those normally would increase from, you know, a, um, a cup of coffee and a, and a hard sprint for, you know, 10 to 30 minutes, maybe an hour. When you do the cold exposure, the way you're doing it, or longer exposures at about 50 degrees or so, you're seeing increases in dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine that are two to three X above baseline. This is huge. Wow. This is huge. This is on the order of many drugs. But the difference is most drugs spike dopamine and then drop it below baseline. 
the increases in this case are lasting many hours, two to four to even six hours. That's amazing. And there are very, and you know, whenever people criticize deliberate cold exposure, they go, it's not leaning to that much fat loss. Granted, but it's, to my knowledge, there is no drug, nor is there any form of exercise, conventional forms of exercise, that increase the catecholamines to that level for that long. And with dopamine, it's all about the, the amplitude and the duration, how fast it rises, how fast it stays up there. There's nothing quite like it. And, you know, I did three plunges here. I'm staying at a place that actually has a plunge. I don't know the temperature, but it felt cold to me. So I did three minutes, three minutes, three minutes, and they had a hot tub, so I bounced back and forth for a minute in between. And you, as you know, you feel better much of the day, if not yeah. the entire day. That is not a coincidence. Your system is circulating much higher levels of the catecholamines. And this is shown in that paper. It's now been shown in a series of other papers. My colleague, Craig Heller at Stanford, has known this for a long time. And this is why, and for other reasons, the athletes at Stanford who use cold do it before their workouts. Yeah. Everyone now knows that it blocks hypertrophy if you do it after. But yeah, if you wait a few hours, you're okay. Four to six hours, you're probably yeah. fine. Yeah, I, I like to do it first thing in the morning just because I don't want to do it first thing in the morning. And that's why I like when people complain about cold plunges. That's not worth it. It doesn't do anything. I'm like, fuck you, it doesn't. You're just, you just don't like the fact that other people can do it every day. And you don't like the fact that you can't do it every day. You're talking to me specifically? No, no, no other okay. people. <laughs> yeah. Not you, you do. Mm -hmm. But there's, there's people out there that will complain about something and find an excuse why it's not beneficial. Right. And the reason for that excuse is not that there's not data. The reason for that excuse is coming up with some sort of an excuse for themselves. That's what that is. Yeah, absolutely.